uh, webinar organised by Open to Export uh, in conjunction with UKCI and HIBU. Um, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, the first couple of minutes there we've been a victim of our own success. I think we uh, apparently we blew the limit of um, how many people were able to watch this. So we had to make some last minute changes. But uh, we've got, I think, well over 100 people on the line. So welcome to you all. Um, we're going to be talking today about um, exporting essentials, customs, VAT, and licensing. As you probably are all familiar, um, this is coming to you through the Open to Export service, the uh, website that most of you will have seen. Um, UKTI uh, is an integral part of organizing this. And one of the things that you'll have seen with the, um, uh, the website is that there are two or three ways of getting information and advice from uh, this service. One is through uh, exercises like today, where we get some experts who I'll be introducing you to shortly, um, talking about a particular topic. That will supplement some of the content, the articles you've seen on the site. You're then very welcome to either ask them questions in the open forum. You do that by uh, typing into the screens that you'll see in front of you, and also by putting questions onto the Open to Export service itself. And those get answered in public by the experts, either on the webinar today or on the site. If you then want to take things further forward, you can access uh, advice by talking to experts directly through the Open to Export service. And so one of the things I'd um, suggest is that any questions you have that are specific to an individual case are probably best off done through the Open to Export service by going in afterwards. But for the moment, let's just get on with our first presentations. Um, you'll see some housekeeping. There's a session which um, allows you to uh, listen, hopefully that you can hear me um, at the moment by clicking on the relevant button on your screens. And there'll also be um, a, a box that you tick that asks you to allow questions. I'll see all of those and I'll put those to the panelists as we go. But before we get going, I would like to start with a little bit of a poll just to give everyone a view of where we're at. What we're trying to get a sense of is where uh, are you on your export journey? And what you'll get now is a couple of questions uh, or rather three options that you can click on now. If you then click on those, it gives our speakers a sense of where you're at on your export journey, what kind of information will be relevant. So if you could start clicking away, I can see most people are going through now. And in a moment, I'll close the poll so that we can see that. I'll let that go just for a moment. And that's just about all of you. So for everyone's interest, in particular our speakers, it's a fairly even split. Now the other thing that obviously is very important on this, uh, this kind of uh, topic is where you're exporting to. So we've got a second very quick question, same format. Where are you consider, uh, considering or currently exporting to? Because that makes a huge difference to the type of advice and support that you'll need. And so if we can quickly get through that, we'll get on to the first speaker. So while you're um, doing that, I'll be passing over to Ray Ward, who works for Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. As with all of our speakers today, Ray's been a good couple of decades in this field. Um, actually, probably a little more than that, Ray, but let me not get into that. Um, his role is to help with the delivery of help and advice to businesses, primarily on VAT and international trade, and he's about to share with you a lot of his experience. Let me show you what experience is going to be most relevant, and from what I can see, most mm. people looking at questions outside the EU or a mix of the EU and outside. Let me move on now, and Jenny, I think this is the point at which we move on to the next speaker. And so I think we should be getting Ray ready to get to his slides. If you bear with us one moment. Now, if I meant to click on this, someone's going to tell me. But you should have control now. So if you just move on the, the slides to the start of your presentation. I'm, I'm clicking. That's perfect. It'll move on in one second. So if you just introduce yourself um, and start off, it'll catch up with you in time. Thank you, Was and Jenny, the wonders of modern technology. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know where you are all sitting. I'm sitting in my office at home on this slightly overcast day. And 
my name is indeed Ray Ward and I work for Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs and hopefully this is going to move on in a minute so that we can uh, we can actually get going. It doesn't seem to want to. Ah, right, here we go, success. Right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we will now, we will now commence this part of the webinar. Um, in this part of the webinar, I will be looking at the VAT position when selling both to the European Union, which from now on I'll refer to as the EU, and to the rest of the world. And my colleague John, who um, was referred to earlier, will talk about the customs implication of international trade, um, that is exporting to countries outside the EU. Now. When trading abroad, it is where your customers are based that determines in the eyes of HMRC whether your supplies are actually exports, that is goods going outside of the European Union, rather than dispatches, which are goods moving between the member states within the EU. Now the EU is a single market with no customs frontiers between member states, allowing goods to move freely between them and it is only when goods enter or leave the EU that any formal customs requirements apply. This means that the customs and VAT regulations that apply will depend on whether you are actually exporting or not. Now, for a bit of light relief and a bit of colour, this slide shows the current member states of the EU. Now, as we know, there are now 28 members, uh, with Croatia having joined on the 1st of July uh, this year. Now, next we're going to look at the, the, the customer groups. Now, your customers will form three basic groups. All customers and the, all UK customers and those in the EU, EU who are not VAT registered. Those registered for VAT in other member states but buy, and buying the goods for business purposes. And customers outside the EU. Now, for the first group, as you can see, UK VAT is chargeable at the appropriate UK rate. For the other two categories, for reasons that I will explain shortly, the sales are zero rated for VAT purposes. That is to say that you don't have to charge UK VAT to those, to those customers, providing you meet the uh, appropriate condition. We'll look firstly at dealing with members of the EU. Now, as I've said mentioned earlier sales of goods to other member states of the EU are known as dispatches and when your customer is VAT registered in another member state you can zero rate your supply if you meet certain conditions and those conditions are that your sales invoice shows your customers VAT registration number including their two letter country code and contains a statement that the sale can be zero rated which can be something as simple, for example, as simply endorsing zero rated EU supply on the invoice. Now, more details of the documents required to support zero rating and the removal of goods from the EU can be found on the gov.uk website or in section 4 of notice 725 dealing with evidence and time limits. And an example of an, of an invoice can be found at section 16.18 of the same public notice. You will see the public notice is referred to at the bottom of the various at the various slides. Um, what we're going to look at now is how this affects you in completing your VAT return and something called an EC sales list, which I'll explain in a moment. Now, the total value of sales to another EU member state is entered into both boxes six and eight on your VAT return. Now as well as your VAT return, if you're making an entry in box 8, you will also need to send HMRC something called a European Sales List, which I'll refer to as an ESL from now on, um, when you sell goods to another EU member state. Now, these ESLs show your customer's two-letter country code. It shows their VAT registration number, the value of the goods that you've sold them, and an, there is an, an, an indicator box on the form. Now, if you're exporting goods, this box is in fact left blank. Um, there's more on EC sales lists again in Notice 725 at Section 17. 
Don't forget though that ECs, the ESLs are normally due every three months, but you will need to start sending them in monthly if your EU sales, your total EU sales, go over the current threshold of £35,000 in any uh, three month period. Uh, you need to be able to identify EU sales in your records easily because that will help you fill out your VAT return collect correctly and in turn will help you when you fill in the ESL. Now, unlike VAT return periods, which can be changed, ESL periods are fixed and they are at the end of they are due at the end of March, June, September, and December. Um, now the ESLs must be submitted like VAT returns by due dates, and those due dates are if you're submitting paper returns 14 days after the end of the period. And if you're submitting electronic returns, 21 days after the end of the period. Now, as an effort, right. sorry, yep. Yeah, there's a few questions coming through, and there's two or three themes coming out. I'll just pick on one of them now briefly, which is that you're talking about the value of the supplies and having to report against them. Yep. If someone has sold a service into another EU state that doesn't have proof of dispatch, then no, 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 no. What? We, Forgive me. What we're talking about here are goods. Services are completely different. Okay. And when it comes to goods, if people don't have proof of dispatch, does that give them a problem? So are these r figures that you're reporting that you can demonstrate were dispatched, or is it just figures that you know even if you don't necessarily have the proof? Is there an issue there? The figures that were going to box eight would be taken from your VAT sales figures, which would have details of the sales invoices to those EU companies. So one would imagine that at least you would have that. I will come on to deal with the consequences of, you know, if you don't have evidence that they were, remo were removed, it can cause you problems, yes. Fine, and just very briefly, um, if you've missed a deadline for a reporting um, period, um, are you yeah. in trouble? Is this for EC, if you're talking about EC sales lists, it's a rel it is a purely statistical exercise. Okay. Um, and so long as so long as they are, you know, as long as they're submitted as soon as you realise you should have done it, um, that there isn't a regime of penalties for the late supply of EC sales lists. The reason right. I say that is that nil returns are no longer required. So if we don't get one, we'll just yeah. assume you haven't done anything until we get one. Great. Sorry, those are the main questions that are coming through. Sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. Not at all. Any time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Right now to to, to move on. Um, we're going to look now at something called interest at. Now what is interest at? I hear a deafening roar from you all. Quite simply, interest at is a way of collecting information on the trade in goods between member states and it is collected by all member states. Uh, so if, you, if your supply of goods to, to the EU goes over a certain limit, as well as recording all your supplies uh, to the EU and putting them on, on your VAT return and an ESL, you will also have to submit information uh, to record your interest tax items. Now this means that you will need to send HMRC something called a supplementary declaration or an SD if your, figure, if your sales go over a certain limit. Now the current limits for a January to December interest tax year, because the interest tax year mirrors the e ESL year is two hundred cumulatively two hundred and fifty thousand pounds worth for dispatches or sales to the EU. Now at the moment, interest at recording on supplementary declarations is only completed for goods and not for services. Uh, ESLs are required for services in certain uh, circumstances. Section eighteen of uh, Notice seven two five covers the question of ESLs in more detail. Now. We turn now to look at, for VAT purposes, um, we are now going to look at the question of exporting the sale of goods to countries or customers outside the EU. Now, you can zero rate exports to your customers as long as the goods leave the EU and you have evidence showing that this happened within three months from the time of supply. Because if the goods don't leave the EU, or they don't leave the EU within three months, or you don't hold the evidence that they left the EU in time, then you will be required to account for VAT at the normal UK rate on those goods. So 
the value of those goods is entered, the value of the sales is shown in box 6 on your VAT return. For goods going outside the EU, you do not put them in box 8. That only deals with uh, EU sales. Moving now to look at trading on the internet. Lots of us use the internet for trading, and there's almost no limit to the types of the types of transactions that can be carried out. The rules, though, are exactly the same if the if the transaction takes place online. So, for the sale of goods to customers in the EU that aren't VAT registered, you charge UK VAT. But, but be, take note that if you make regular supplies to non-registered customers in the EU, you need to be aware of something called distance selling rules. Now the distance selling rules may, if your sales to certain EU member states exceed certain thresholds, may require you to register in other member states in the EU. Now for the sale of goods to VAT registered EU customers obviously, or you can zero rate the invoice must keep your full business records as usual and for more information look at the internet trading guidance on the HMRC website. Lastly, um, in this part of the webinar, just a couple of things to remember. Most significantly, remember the v to get the VAT registration numbers for any customers that you're dealing with uh, within the EU. And remember also that you need to keep proof of anything that you sell abroad. Now obviously that proof includes obviously copies of customers' orders, transport documentation, if you're exporting, the, the, the uh, evidence of export that John will talk about, um, anything basically that you generate in connection with a transaction, you need to keep. Um, and basically I think was that uh, just about concludes my part of the of this presentation, and we, if, unless you have anything you want me to deal with at this stage. Yeah, Ray, that's been very useful, and I think from what I'm seeing of the questions, you've covered almost everything that people are asking. There's a couple I'll just pick up that might have been answered or might need clarification. Yeah, no One problem. In, there's a, a lady that's saying that their EC sales are well under the 35k quarterly threshold, but they have to complete ESL on a monthly basis. Can they change our submission to quarterly? Is that a correct question? I, or is I, can I ask whether they're dealing with services as well? Because if they're dealing with services as well, that would have a difference. Okay, so no. I'm not going to be able to get the answer back quickly. No, so no. I'll just, I'll get a comment. But could you just Gen talk generally, spe generally speaking, they are yes. quarterly. Sorry, the answer um, is yes, as well. Well, that's the answer. If they're used, if they're doing services as well, that would that would explain it. They, that's why they're having to do it monthly. Okay. Um, and so there's no way of changing it to quarterly. It's it's mandatory, I guess. Yes. And the second question, there's someone who sells products on behalf of a British com uh, client, and they're asking who's responsible for the VAT. Is it them or the person they're selling on behalf of? They're selling on behalf of. Yes. Whose name is, who's, do we know whose name the sales invoice is, is raised in? We don't, but I was assuming that would be what it all comes down to. It's the name yeah. on the, um, the invoice, isn't it? Yes. Okay, yeah. fine. I, I would need I would need to know more about that one to be to be completely specific. Okay, what I'm going to do is move us on. There's a whole load of questions coming back through, but I'm going to gather those up and let us move on to the the next speaker. Um, at that point, we'll probably be doing the same thing. So what we've not got now is John Griffiths, um, a business advisor from HMRC again. John's uh, presentation is going to be focusing on. Uh, possible ways of reducing costs through customs relief and regimes, and he's got a lot of experience in warehousing, international trade, customs freight, and procedures. And I think if we pass over to John in a moment, we'll be able to get quite a lot more insight. However, before we do that, I'd like you to help me again in the audience with another poll. What we're now looking at is where do you go for your advice? Because that's going to help us figure out how we can make sure that the service and the users give you the best service you need. So most people tend to use one of these five. If you tell us which ones of these are the place you normally start, it'll be pretty helpful for everyone. And while we're doing that, 
John's going to be getting ready to talk for a few minutes. We're almost through. I can see most people have voted. I'm going to close in a few seconds. That'll do. Okay, so I'm now going to share the results of that. Okay, I'm going to move us on now. And we should now be getting back to our next speaker. And any moment now, we should see the screen switch to John's presentation. John, are you ready to give us a few minutes? <coughs> yeah, certainly. So, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is John Griffiths, and I work with Ray. And uh, I predominantly deal with um, exports and imports as well, so trade outside the, the EU. So what I'm going to be talking about is um, featuring exports uh, and also a little bit on how we may be, may be able to save you uh, time and money. That's if I can get the slide to move on. If you just bear with it, John, it should move on in a couple of moments. Yeah, okay. For you if you keep continuing to present. Okay, so exporting then um, is when you send goods to non EU countries for commercial purposes. And export then is when you sell goods to a country outside the European Union. So I'm focusing on trade outside the EU, not EU trade, as Ray was actually talking about. Before you can uh, export or import, in fact, I'm not going to be highlighting much of importing, but there's a lot of basic criteria that are the same for exports and imports. You need what's called an EORI number, which, apologies, it is a real mouthful. It is there, as you can see, an Economic Operator Registration and Identification Number, an EORI number, and it's common throughout the all EU member states. So any business involved in customs activities, that's who wants to import into the EU or export out of the EU, needs an EORI number. The EORI number will be issued to a legal entity, uh, and if you haven't got an EORI number and you're considering uh, exporting or importing, that's the email address you need to, um, you need to contact in order to request uh, your EORI number. That's an example of an EORI number there we've got for you uh, actually on the slide. It's um, a start with GB, followed by the, a 12-digit number, which is based on your VAT number, and HMRC add three digits to your VAT number, usually three zeros there. So to avoid any delays when moving goods, we recommend that you actually should apply uh, before making your first import or export. So moving on, um, what you need to do before you import or export goods is we need a declaration, and it's actually called another bit of a mouthful, a SAD, believe it or not, a single administrative document. And that is the common document throughout all 28 EU countries. In the uh, UK, it's known as a form C88. Now, there's lots of bits of information on this form, including who the exporter is, where the goods are actually going to. But two of the key bits of information there you can see are the commodity code and the customs procedure code. The commodity code is key if you want to export anything. We're talking goods now. You need to find the commodity code. And there are 94 chapters in the volume two of the customs tariff, and that's where these commodity codes can be found. So that we do provide help on finding the right commodity code for your goods, but you, if you, you do need a commodity code because your goods might be subject to export licensing, for example. And if you need, if they are subject to export licensing, then you know you don't might not know that until you obtain this commodity code. Once you get the code, you'll be able to see if there are any export restrictions. Mike will give more information on on uh, uh, export licensing uh, in his talk. Um, so moving on then, the customs procedure code, that tells, it, we, it tells everyone really who knows what it means, what's actually going to happen to the goods. And that is a code for, um, there's, there's a code for basic import, a code for basic exports, a code for everything. There's 360 odd of these codes. So again, you might need some help to find the right code for your goods. And if you're not sure, 
the information can be found in the, in the customs tariff, but your freight forwarder should be able to provide you with some assistance for our helplines if you're not sure. So they're, they're two of the key bits you require um, before you make a declaration. Now most people who import or export use a freight forwarder uh, to do the declaration on their behalf. You can actually do the export declaration yourselves, but most companies do actually use a freight forwarder to facilitate it for them. And you need to, a freight forwarder can act in one of two ways. Um, the majority of freight forwarders act as a direct representative, and that means effectively they're making the customs declaration on your behalf and in your name. So you alone are liable for the customs debt, not the freight forwarder. Now obviously at export there's no money to pay, there's money to pay at import with customs duty and potentially import VAT at export, but there could be issues with things like export licensing if somebody declares a code incorrectly to avoid getting an, an export license. Um, and the, if the freight forward is acting as a direct representative, then effectively it's the importer's responsibility. The other option is an indirect representative. And that means that the freight forwarder is actually making the declaration in their name. And both you and the freight forwarder are liable for any potential customs debt or any issues. So you can see, hopefully, as I've explained this, the vast majority of freight forwarders would certainly opt to be direct representatives rather than indirect representatives. So moving on to the actual export procedures then. Details of your exports need to be declared on this form C88 and they go into our customs computer, which is another mouthful here, Customs Handling of Import and Export Freight, or CHIEF for short. The virtually all declarations are made as full under the full pre-entry procedure, which I'll talk about in a, in a couple of seconds. And evidence of export is provided by arrival and departure messages. Notice 275 on export procedures provides you with all the information you require to do with the export procedures, because obviously I'm just going to have a chance to summarise them today. So moving on then to the, uh, the full entry procedure. To do the full entry procedure, authorisation is not required. You could actually do this yourself if you wanted to, but you'd have to sort of know there's about 45 boxes to fill out on an export declaration, and you'd need uh, one of the copies of the tariff to help you actually uh, complete those boxes. So the full entry is submitted to our customs computer system. The vast, vast majority is submitted electronically. I think it's about 98, 99% are submitted electronically. You could fill one of these out by paper and then post it to customs, but you need to be aware that it might take a day or so to get to us. Uh, an officer then has to sit in front of a computer terminal and actually input that information into our computer. And by the time they've done that, the ship may have sailed or the plane may have taken off. Take, taken off. So the declarations then can be submitted by the exporter or the vast majority are completed by the third party. And that's usually freight forwarders. So goods are arrived at the port or place of dispatch. And at that point, the declaration is legally accepted by HMRC and our customs computer decides, do we want to take any further action? And if not, the, the uh, shipment is given permission to progress, and then the goods are exported. We have two kinds of exports. We have a direct export and indirect export. A direct export is when goods leave the UK directly for a non-EU destination. So a container ship going from Southampton to New York, and it's not touching the EU. And the evidence of export here is provided by a goods departure message uh, that goes into our customs computer chief and your freight forwarder should be able to provide you with a copy of that. Indirect exports are when goods leave via another EU member state. So if I'm sending a product out to Moscow and that's going out through Dover onto Calais through France, Germany, the point of export will be where those goods leave the European Union, and that would, I suggest, be either Poland, Latvia, or Lithuania. So a, a message comes back from Poland, Latvia, and Lithuania that says the goods have been exported. That goes into our customs computer, and again, your freight forwarder should be able to provide you with a copy of that. So that is your evidence of export in the case of an indirect export. Just going to look at very quickly some of the uh, duty relief procedures. 
that um, you might consider using. Now, some of these are, are both connected with importing and exporting. For example, the first one is inward processing relief, and this allows relief from various import duties on which you import into the EU, you process them, and as long as the process product is exported outside of the EU, you don't have to pay us any VAT and duty or duty. Customs warehousing is a storage regime. This is where you import product from outside the EU. You keep it in storage as long as you want. And then once you release it, you pay us the VAT duty on it. But if you export it outside of the EU, you don't pay us anything because it's never formally been imported. It's under duty suspension, effectively. Um, outward processing is the opposite of inward processing. You send product outside the EU on a temporary export for processing or repair, and then you claim full or partial duty relief when the goods are then re-imported. And finally, we have export preference. We have a lot of preference agreements with uh, countries outside, we being the EU, not the UK. These are agreements between the European Union and countries outside the EU. And it means that EU goods can go to countries, a lot of countries outside the EU, and enter those countries at a reduced or zero rate of duty, as long as they originate in the EU and satisfy the relevant rule of origin. There are uh, half an hour webinars on all these procedures on our website, hmrc.gov.uk, and you can access them via the Open to Export site. There are links there. So, just finally, a little bit on the records. You obviously need to keep an audit trail for goods you, you import or export to show the value of the goods, the classification, what was the commodity code, um, orders, invoicing, delivery notes, obviously payment and receipt you received for the goods, because if the, if the uh, buyer abroad had not received the goods, then they wouldn't pay for them. Um, so you need to keep this audit trail. This isn't a complete list, it's just a, a, a recommended uh, sample of the, the kind of information you need to keep. And you need to keep your records for at least four years if there's no VAT involvement. But if there is a VAT involvement, I'm afraid it's six years. So finally, where to get more help? There's the gov.uk site um, we've got there, which is for all government services. Uh, the HMRC website, hmrc.gov.uk. And this, this is for, for EU and non-EU trade. This is, this is the best place to go. We have public notices on anything and everything to do with import-export procedures that can be accessed again on our website. And uh, finally, we have our helpline. Now that brings my, the bit, uh, my, my talk to an end. Uh, is there any, are there any questions that have come through or do we want to proceed straight to, to Mike's section? Well, our problem is there are loads and loads of questions. So what I'm going to do is actually move us on to the next poll so that while people are um, looking at the next question, which is uh, views on where the key barriers are stopping you from uh, exporting more, I'll go through a couple of the easier ones, then we'll move on to Mike, and then I'll try and round up with a lot of these, because some of them apply to everyone. So let me just kick off this poll first, and then give you a couple of the questions that are coming out. So um, there's two or three, actually more than two or three folks, that are trying to get their head around what happens if you're using a courier in terms of the various declarations and the paperwork required. Does that count as something like a freight forwarder? Do you need to have the same um, codes included, or does that get looked after for you? Uh, generally speaking, if, you, if you're using one of the fast parcel operators uh, yeah. and the value of the exports are, are below uh, £2,000, then um, you would just get a, tr a tracker number from the fast parcel operator, because that's an agreement HMRC have got with the fast parcel operator. Um, however, that doesn't cover if goods are, are, if those goods are subject to customs procedures, um, such as customs warehousing, inward processing, outward processing, that dispensation doesn't apply. That dispensation okay. is only for goods in free circulation subject to no customs procedures. So it, it's £2,000 uh, is, is the general rule if goods are, are, are sent via a fast parcel operator. And we'll, we'll, we would accept a tracker number for those goods. So if someone tells you that they've been told by their courier they don't need to worry about this, the answer really is it depends rather than a flat yes or no. Yeah, the answer is it depends on the value of the goods and what, what procedures those goods are being subject to. That, that's okay. the actual answer. 
The worldwide commodity codes, are, are they um, things that are um, recognized everywhere, the, the commodity codes that you refer to and the other reference numbers actually? Um, the, so if someone uses them, they're not going to have any issues with them not being recognized somewhere else? I'm afraid that's not the case, no. The uh, EU codes are all the same, so if you want to import goods into the European Union or export goods out of the European Union, all those codes will be the same in each of the EU countries. But you cannot assume an American code, a Russian code, a Chinese code is going to be an EU code. They may be different. The first six digits should be the same, but the, hot, the extra, we don't forget, I said it's, two, it's, it's eight digits for export. So by the time we get the extra two digits on, for imports, it's, it's another, another couple of digits, actually. So the codes may, you can, what I'm trying to say there is you cannot assume that a non-EU code is going to be the same code in the EU. You have to get the codes checked out. We're really cutting into Mike's time, but I'm just going to struggle on with two very brief questions, if we could try and keep them quite quick. Um, what do people with a flat rate um, VAT scheme um, do with all of this? Uh, Ray? <laughs> okay. That, uh, we'll need Ray to get unmuted. Let's oh, sorry. I, th I, thought, I thought Ray was actually on uh, there at the minute, so uh, that, that's more of a pure back question, and I'm not, I'm not sure there's any exemption for... I don't know, think that makes any difference if they're on a flat oh. rate. If they, right. my, re my, per my recommendation for anybody involved in exporting would be that the flat rate scheme would not necessarily be, be the um, particularly advantageous thing. Um, okay. I can no, that's, I think that answers the question very yeah. clearly. <laughs> the final question for you, John, of this section. If someone is exporting something for repairs by the original equipment manufacturer, then does that get handled in the same way uh, in terms of VAT and um, customs? Or yeah, well, they would, need the evidence, the, they would need the evidence of export. Uh, and it could be, if, if it's being exported to be repaired and come back again, then that's, that would probably fall under this outward processing relief uh, section, or goods for okay. repair and return, which is our notice 235 they would need to look at. Okay, that's great. I'm going to um, cut the questions, even though there are an awful lot more. Um, everyone does have the option to put these on the Open to Export website afterwards, where they will get um, passed on, and we, we were doing that ourselves. And so anyone that's had their question not answered yet, it's going to be on the list that we cover. Um, I've just been showing the results of the poll for everyone's interest, which shows where the key barriers are. What I'm now going to do is move us on so that we have a few words from Mike Yospenko, the Director of Special Projects at the Institute of Exports. Um, Mike, in the interests of time, I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself, if I may, because then you can get on to your uh, content as quickly as you wish. And once you've done that, we should have about 10 minutes at the end. We started a moment or two late. But we'll have about 10 minutes at the end to try and pick out the most uh, exciting of the questions. As I say, there are lots and lots of them, but let's uh, get through this. I think we should be getting the slides moved on to Mike's presentation. There we go. Mike, over to you now, please. Good. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Josipenko. I work for the Institute of Export, and I'm going to give you a very quick run through uh, some issues around export licensing and controls. So what we're going to be looking at, first of all, is the purposes of export controls, and then we'll have a look at some of the different types of licenses that apply to different categories of goods, starting with strategic export licensing, and then moving on to some other types of licensing and control. Okay, so what is the purpose of export? The control or prevent the sale and also importation of certain goods. And these can be military or strategic equipment, technology, dual use goods, uh, objects of cultural interest such as artwork, etc., animal, plant, or foodstuffs products, but also drugs, medicines, and chemical products. Now, a lot of different categories there, and each category. Uh, has the licensing controlled by different authorities. Now, I would say at the start here, uh, most products are not subject to licensing restrictions, but if you're in any doubt, you need to check because it is a criminal offence to export licensable goods uh, without uh, valid licenses, and I'm afraid ignorance is not a, an argument in court. Now, we heard earlier that um, the EU is a single trading block with no internal customs regulations, 
but you should bear in mind that some export licenses can apply even if you're if you're trading within the EU. Okay, so we'll look at strategic export licensing. So this covers a variety of products, and the first and foremost is uh, equipment or goods which are used for military purposes. That includes weapons, vehicles, ammunition, and other products which are used in that context. Um, licenses may also be required for what is known as dual use goods. Now these are products with a civilian use but which could also have a possible military application. So typical products could include chemicals, raw materials, also equipment and machinery, uh, whether it's electronic, whether it's anal analytical equipment, computers, telecommunications, navigation, sensors, and obviously marine and aerospace products uh, can have a military application. Technology and software can fall under the, the, the realm of export licensing, and also goods that could be used for torture or repression of civilians, and of course radioactive products. Now, the list of goods which are controlled are contained on what is known as the UK Strategic Export Control Lists. Now, this is actually a, a, a sequence of different lists, uh, one of which being military list, and a separate one for dual use list, and then various other ones which cover specific regulations that are country specific. So, what dictates whether goods may be subject to licensing? Well, the first factor is what the goods are, the product description. And we heard in a previous presentation about HS codes or customs codes. So if you go to the customs code which applies for your goods, you will see at the bottom there footnotes which will indicate whether export licensing regulations may apply. The destination country may have an impact on whether goods require an export license and the purpose of use. It may also depend on who the end user or the end receiver of the goods is. Now, there is um, a, a listing of, um, uh, sorry, uh, there is uh, on the guide somewhere, there is a, a website, to, uh, a link to a beginner's guide on export controls, which actually contains a general summary of these regulations and an overview, uh, including some videos that you might like to access. I believe that's coming up on another slide. Uh, you may find that some goods which aren't included on any of these lists may also be subject to controls. Um, this is basically where um, particular users, particular individuals or companies are identified as potential risks uh, and the sale of certain products to them is restricted. So looking at strategic export licenses, there are three main types of export license. The first one is an open general export license. So this is generally less restricted. Um, in terms of ex export destinations and products. These are pre-published licenses with set terms and conditions that you've got to adhere to and you register to say that you'll adhere to them. The second is a single individual export license. Now this is an individual license used by a specific exporter for specific goods going to a, a specific market and a consignee. And then there's an open individual export license, which could cover multiple shipments by an exporter to a particular destination. And that can apply for different clients in that destination. Now, as we mentioned all before, you may also need to supply or to have an end user certificate to identify the client that you're selling to in that country. It's actually it's more formally known as a, an undertaking, and it's a form which is completed by the end user and which is supplied back to you, which you need to supply at the time of application. And those certificates can be downloaded from the website of the Export Control Office. So where do you go to find out more? Well, Strategic Export Licenses is controlled by the Export Control Office, which is part of the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. And on the slide, you can see contact details. And also, uh, there is a staff guide, which I referred to earlier. That will give you a beginner's guide to export controls, including the video. Licenses are issued through a portal which is known as Spire and you need to register with that to apply. You can also, once you register, you can also access resources that they've got there such as uh, a self-checker so you can check whether goods are subject to licensing or not. You could also apply for an external assessment by somebody from the Export Control Office. 
Uh, if you want to check the lists to see whether goods may be subject to uh, restrictions, you can go to the link at the bottom. Now, a quick point here, um, there is no fixed correlation, unfortunately, between the customs code and the descriptions which are covered in that list. So if you find from the customs, note, from the customs code that you may be subject to license or restrictions, what you need to do is to read through the particular areas of those export strategic lists and find, read the descriptions and assess for yourself whether your projects or your products are subject to licensing. Actually, Mike, if I could interrupt just briefly on that Sorry. specific question. Yes. You're getting a few people asking, um, expanding on that point, which is they're sometimes getting a little confused about when to apply which code in what situation. Um, the initial guidance, I think, is to read through the details and try and make a judgment. What would be the most um, effective trying to get some clarification on that. What would you the Export Control Office directly on that number, which is a helpline number, and they should be able to give you initial indication, although I think it is worth registering on the Spire uh, portal in any case, and that will give you the chance to assess that in more detail. There are, there are mechanisms that you can follow to check the goods. But ultimately, in the worst case scenario, uh, you can get a formal assessment by the Export Control Office. Okay. And related to that, I think people have, um, from what I can see, people have found all of these presentations, including this last one, of course, very helpful in clarifying what route they should go down. But the question seems to be on very specific steps for clarification at this point in the procedure, what do I do next? Um, how should people go about trying to get the detailed questions answered? Is that something where it's going to these general places of support, or should you be looking for a, a professional advisor getting into the specifics? Because these are very specific, detailed um, bits of advice well, that we're looking if for. They are, if they are specific to individual companies or individual products, then I think, again, uh, contract, contact the ECO directly, seek advice from them. If you feel yeah. you're not getting uh, assistance, then there are, there are consultants and specialists who can help and advise you. But, of course, bear in mind that at the end of the day, it's your name on the export declaration, so you are the one that's ultimately responsible, so you need to satisfy yourself that any advice you receive from any individual is, is valid. So, so I would always recommend going straight to the specialists. To the, well, to the, to exactly. The, for example, someone's um, putting up a question where they've asked um, about two or three of these um, sets of procedures that we've covered today. They're in yes. a business where they're doing things with alcohol, and I think they're trying to understand how these apply to alcohol, and it seems like there are four or five different places where they'd need to check what applies and what doesn't. Is that the kind of question that should go to the help desk that you've been referring to? Um, I mean, I'm talking specifically whether the questions deal more generally with VAT or uh, customs issues. Obviously, the, in terms of export licensing, yes, I would suggest that the help desk, if it's if it's deal with the individual use of exporting or VAT, then there are there are helplines from HMRC that will deal with both of those aspects of it. Um, there is, unfortunately, I'm not aware of any overarching authority. The, the Institute of Export does run an export helpline for its members, where we try to provide assistance. Um, but of course, that's not a you know that's uh, that's that's run by us. Uh, we're not we're not formally linked with the Export Control Office. So you know, we would always refer you direct to speak directly to the Export Control Office in the case of any licensing to get a definitive answer. Okay, so two questions specific to the licensing. I think they're specific. One is if someone has a particular product and they want to check whether it requires a license, um, what's the best place for them to get that clarification? Is it exactly the same process as you just described, those sources of help, or is there a directory somewhere? Well, the export control lists are the first point of contact. And yep. the, the, the two main ones being that if the product is appropriate, it may be on the military list. Um, if not, yep. it may be on the dual control list, which is more to the point. And the dual control list is broken up into 10 categories, depending on the, the nature of the product. And they, each uh, category is then subdivided to have individual assessments, individual listings of specific product types with fairly detailed descriptions. So what they would need to do is to look in the appropriate chapters for, for, for their product and drill down, read, read if necessary, trawl through all the descriptions in that category to find something that may or may not match theirs. And obviously they will be, they will be looking at it with a, a reasonable level of expertise and knowledge of their own product. So they should be able to find um, within those descriptions whether there is a licensing requirement and what that is. If in doubt, I would say. 
It's ultimately their judgment based on the description and then a call to the helpline to clarify. I, I would always suggest, if in, if in any doubt, to help a call to the helpline. They are the experts. They are the, the end arbiters on this. So if you're in any doubt, I would suggest uh, certainly a call to the helpline. And the other question related, there's an awful lot of questions from people that are either advisors, consultants, or representatives of organizations, and they're asking the same question. Do they need a license, or is it on behalf of the person doing the exporting? Depend. There are specific exporting licensing regulations for people who act as brokers, and I suggest that they go to the, uh, the gov.site where you can get um, the overview of the export controls. You can find further information there. Okay. That's very helpful. What I'm now going to do is, Jenny, if we could unmute the other speakers' microphones. There's a few questions. In fact, there are lots of questions. We're going to have way too many questions for the time, but in the last five, <laughs> six I want to go through a few of the questions that seem to be cropping up. Um, was. Quite yeah. Can, can I just add a bit of clarification to the flat rate scheme question I answered a little while ago? Please do. The person who is on the flat rate scheme, the the figure that they apply their flat rate percentage to is their box six figure on their VAT return, which will include their zero rated exports. And so if they're on the flat rate scheme, they will actually be paying output tax on zero rated export. So my advice to them would be not to use the flat rate scheme. That helps clarify that. Okay. Um, what I've got there's a few questions that I'm not entirely sure who they're best for, so I'm just going to put them and see who volunteers. Um, there's only two or three that I think are worth doing on this. I'll talk about what we do with the rest of the questions. So one question is if someone's got a bundled price where they're selling a product and they're putting some services into um, implement or install, and they're trying to kind of keep separate from the customer how this is broken down. How does that work in terms of reporting and VAT and um, generally kind of exposure to the customer of all the details that they're trying to uh, keep a little more opaque? Is that a question that makes sense? Yeah, it is. I mean, as for the agreement between, presumably, the agreement between the supplier and the customer is that the goods will be supplied in an installed state at the end of the day. If there yeah, is a component, if, if there's a, the if they the, are, sorry, it'll be up and running. Yeah, if that, there is no need for them necessarily to quote on their invoice a goods and installation price. If they agree a bundle price then they'll just apply VAT to the lot and they won't necessarily have they won't have to differentiate between the two. I think the question what's behind the question is the clarification earlier where we said if someone's got services it's handled differently to exporting goods. Yeah no 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 services it, don't count. In, the, in this in this situation, if you were supplying installed goods to someone outside the EU, then VAT is not an issue. If you're supplying okay. installed goods within the EU to somebody who is VAT registered, you won't be charging them VAT anyway. Okay. I've got a different question, which uh, again, I'm not quite sure how this would work, but uh, if you've got someone in the UK who's exporting something to a customer internationally, but mm. the goods they're exporting actually are coming direct from China, I presume that's where they've got a, a manufacturer or distributor. Um, right. The money's coming into a UK bank account at some point. Yeah. How does that get handled in terms of VAT? It's out, like, it, it's outside the screen. If, if, the, if the actual supplier of the goods is in China and the customer is in, let's say, America, and the goods never actually come here, um, then it's outside the scope of, of UK VAT. VAT isn't a consideration. So the fact that the invoice comes from the UK to the customer in the US... It's, it where, just... it's, where, it's where the supply actually takes place. It's a question of who makes the physical supply, in this case China, to the customer, in this case in America. The person in the UK is not actually conducting that business in the UK. Okay, so we've got a few people that are asking similar questions. If they want to get that clarified, again, what's their best port of call to try and get this um, addressed? So uh, in well, terms of clarification, confirmation, they've not got it wrong. Right, I, I did agree with, with, um, with Jenny that I would deal with any of the VAT questions that come up as a result of this. So if you want to sort of compile, a, if you like, a, a list of questions, let Jenny have them. If she gives them to me, I will make sure they get answered. 
that actually um, is a good uh, segue to one of the points I wanted to make, which is that I've been answering a lot of the people that have been asking questions where they're reasonably specific questions. My feedback has been if I'm not able to get the questions out, either because we're out of time or because they're too specific for a general yeah. audience, the first port of call would be to put your question onto the Open to Export website because at that point you certainly get UKTI and HMRC and others answering. It's also an opportunity for people to come back and say, I'm able to help with more information. So it's a way of meeting other experts and also um, other SMEs and businesses that have experienced the same issue were, are often pretty good at answering. So one thing to do is put your question up. And what Jenny's able to then do is take the questions that are, come straight from this webinar, if people refer to that, and we can give those straight to you, Ray, so that you can see yeah. what's, uh, yeah. what needs to be yeah. done. There, there, there is an arrangement in existence, uh, a relatively recent arrangement, I don't know if it's actually started yet, where our written inquiry section are going to be monitoring the VAT questions on the Open to Export website, but on for the purposes of today, I've agreed to take them all. Okay, that sounds very, very, very helpful indeed. Um, I, may I may regret it, but I've said <laughs> that I'll take them all. Well, one of the things that we're doing is making sure that the UKTI commercial offices in the countries relevant to the particular questions are also keeping a watching brief on this. And so the point of the webinar is not just to answer questions in this session, but also to create a channel for people that have ongoing queries to make sure that um, they're being addressed. And so it's, it's a fundamental part of how the Open to Export service works, is making sure that we're getting people an ongoing opportunity to, to get help, not just a one-off for the one hour. Um, and as I've said to many people that have been sending in questions, um, all of this is going to be available as a recording afterwards, so you'll get the slides and you'll get to be able to hear again. I think one gentleman is saying he's concentrating on the words and so he's not able to take notes. Um, I've got a question where someone's asking about finished goods not attracting VAT, but what about VAT paid at import on packing materials? Is that a question that is meaningful? It doesn't quite work for me, but I'm not really an expert on this. Sorry, can you, you run that by me again? Yeah, the question says, finished goods don't attract VAT, so what happens yes. about VAT paid at import on packing materials? I don't it's quite... It, provide, provide, it's providing the end product is a zero rated product, yeah. then the, any VAT that is incurred in the course of producing that zero rated product is fully recoverable. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, and I'm just trying to see. We're down to the last minute or so, and I'm just trying to see if there's anything that's not going to lead. Yeah. How do we deal with VAT when an export client collects the goods from the UK? That's quite an interesting one, I think. <laughs> yeah, Anyone? right. You said you were going to answer, ask a quick question. No, well, quick but, no, no. <laughs> it, 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 dep it, it depends. You have two different, you have basically got two scenarios here. You've got what we call a retail export, where a, a non-European visitor buys goods from a shop with the intention of removing them to, to their place of residence, which is a re there's a retail export scheme in connection with that. If you're looking at a basically an X works supply, where the customer comes along and picks up the goods, and to be honest, you don't know whether he takes them, where he says he's going to take them. Notice seven two. Uh, we'll cover it if it's in if it's within the if their customers within the EU. Otherwise, my recommendation would be take the, take any potential VAT as a deposit on the basis that you'll refund it once they provide you with the export evidence. Yeah, and I would agree with that totally. I'm going to have to cut across now because we're just about to end. Hopefully, I won't get a cut off in a second or two. Um, we've come to the end of our time. Um, we're going to be closing down the webinar now. Thank you very much for all the speakers and all the audience. Apologies for the little bitch at the beginning. Um, this has been, I think, very, very valuable. We're certainly getting very good feedback even as we're going. Um, when we finish, if anyone on the webinar would like to take a look at the Open to Export website, they'll see uh, the material and they'll be able to put more questions on. And the other thing is as soon as we close the webinar, there'll be a little survey. If you could take 30 seconds just to give us your feedback on how this webinar went. It's very important to us to make sure that UKTI is able to get more and better webinars like this going back to you. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day and weekend. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Are we done? Not yet. <laughs>